Turn with us today to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 8. Jeremiah, that's the clean white pages before Matthew. Jeremiah, chapter number 8. I'm just going to read a few verses, beginning at verse number 19. Verse number 19 down through verse number 22. Jeremiah chapter number 8. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black, astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? I'm going to come back to Jeremiah chapter 8, but I want to read from the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Uh, Two verses, actually Three verses, first number 12 and 13, first Corinthians 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Verse number 26. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. We'll stop there. Father, we pray for your unction today, the direction, the authority of your voice. Speak clearly into our hearts and help us as a people to recognize where we're at and what we're to do. We confess our need for it. We're desperate for your direction and for, Lord, your leadership and your spirit. Help us now to obey you. And Lord, to change, forgive us where we failed, as we seek you with all of our heart, we seek in Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Jeremiah was in a different position, I think, than we are. I don't want to suggest today that we're in exactly the same position as Jeremiah. We are not yet there. Jeremiah could see the enemy. He could see how they had taken over the city. He had watched the desperate condition of his people as they were being starved, raped, all different manners of evil, and Jeremiah was in despair. He spoke clearly here in the verse number 19 that I shared he asked a question is not the Lord in Zion how in the world can such a thing happen to us the people of God I'm not speaking about us I'm still referring to Jeremiah he was asking himself the question is not the Lord in this place how do we get ourselves in such a place he said that The enemy has overrun us. Everything that we've had is no longer ours. It's been obtained. We're now the slaves and we're 
being abused and will likely be hauled off into another land. And Jeremiah was grieved in his heart. You needn't but read the book of Lamentations to know the depth of his grief. And I wonder today if we're grieved. Are we grieved at the condition of our people? Jeremiah was talking about his people. He wasn't talking about others or another nation. He was talking about his own people. Are we grieved at the condition of our people? I think we are, at least some. I believe there's certainly some that bear the burden every day, that wake up with the thought that the summer has ended and we're not saved yet, that there are people that are in a desperate condition and they are not saved yet. I believe that there's some among us that recognize the Lord is still here. And though the the circumstances seem to be growing more grave each day, and I don't expect them to get better. That's not our hope. Our hope is not in a in a cure for something that ails us physically. Jeremiah was in a position where he had to ask the question, and I believe it was valid. It was, a, it was a relevant question for the time. Is not the Lord still here? What's wrong with you? He was able in verse number 20, I believe it was, 21. Let me read it. He said, for the, for the, for the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt saying that because my people hurt, I'm hurting. Because my loved ones are suffering, I suffer. And you see the correlation of what we read from Corinthians. We're one body. To those that have been born into Christ, baptized into one body. Though we're many members, and each member individual and unique in its own right, We are still one body. And the apostle was clear enough, I believe, to say that when one suffers, we all suffer. Now, we only have to apply this to the flesh to know it true, right? And that was his analogy. He started in verse number 12 and and finished it there in 13, as I read to you, uh, the analogy about the body. If if, if one member of your body is suffering, it causes the rest of the body to suffer. Um, I, was, I was doing a chore for my wife at her command a while back, and, and as I was screwing a board on to a chicken pen, I drove the drill bit through my thumbnail. And, and it hurt. It's just now getting better. It hurt. Now that was my thumbnail. But every part of my body knew that I was hurt. Every bit of the pain that that caused ran through the nervous system of my body and to my brain. And best I understand of what takes place in the human body, my brain started giving some directions. There was additional blood flow started going to that. Absent of anything I did myself, my body did this automatically. Additional blood flow taking additional blood and the healing platelets and cells that would immediately start trying to heal the wound that had just occurred. You don't think we're hurting. I'll get to the problem here in a second, but but there's some people hurting. And you know why we're hurting? Because our people are sick. When one suffers, we all suffer. Let me say this. If you're not suffering, you best take an inventory. If it doesn't bother you, that there are so many people bound by the sin of this world, you need to repent and wake up to the first love. 
Because if you don't love your people, you don't love God. If it doesn't bother you to know that there are loved ones that are in a dangerous condition today, then we need to truly repent. Jeremiah was in a position where he could see the suffering. Physically, he could see it. But his question to them was, is, is, is the Lord not still here? And of course, they couldn't hear Jeremiah. They wouldn't hear Jeremiah. They wouldn't flee. They wouldn't, they wouldn't lay down the false gods and the idols that had provoked the anger of God among them and had brought this judgment into their lives. And in the last verse, verse number 22, all this meant to be an introduction to say to you what Solomon said to the others, there's nothing new under the sun. He said, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there not a physician among us? If there is, why is my people still sick? That was then. This is now. I find a lot of what he wrote in the book of Lamentations to be relevant to our position or condition today. We got people all around us that know better. Right? They know better, but they're living in sin. They're living as if there's no recompense to sinfulness, knowing all the while in their heart that you don't get by. God never sweeps anything under the rug. Every example from the word of God, though his mercy and his great be extraordinary, wondrous, and marvelous, I can assure you today that there is a penalty for sin. You will reap what you sow. I can't change that. I can't fix it. And so I grieve. Because they don't have to be sick. Is there not a bomb in Gilead? Yes, that's the answer. Is there not a Lord still here? Yes. He is still here. Is there not a physician that can heal my people? Yes, is the answer to those questions. Yet the summer is past and they're still not saved. Their suffering continues and it gets worse as we go along. You say you act as if in your, you're in despair. I'm not in despair, I'm in disgust. Why? Because I know there is a cure for the sickness that ails every person. They refuse it. They reject it. Not once, they are rejecting it every day they awake. They are rejecting the cure for the sickness that has come to their homes, their lives, their families. They have been infected by sin. It has poisoned their blood and they are us. We can't separate them from us, nor do we want to. We cannot, because one is infected by sin, chop it off and say, there, that's done, it's fixed. You can't do that. Chop off a finger and you just got a bigger problem. We are one body. And every member of God's body, if it is sick, has brought an infection. And brother, there is a cure for the infection and we need to share it. We need to be part of the solution. We need to be burdened in a way that we would automatically respond and send to the direction of the infected the very thing it needs for the cure to begin. 
When someone has an infection, a serious infection, they give them antibiotics. Now, by nature, antibiotics is not something you want in your blood system. They are antibiotic. But it takes them to attack the infection that has set up within your system, and without them, the the infection grows worse. And with too much infection, there can be more and hard and, and harmful issues take place. May I say to you today, there is a cure for sin. There is a cure for the infection that it brings to a family, to a home, to a heart, and you stare at others as if there is no way that they can be delivered. I declare to you today, we need not be in despair, but we need to declare the cure. We need to be a part of the administering of the cure. The love of Christ is the only antibiotic for the infection of sin. The love of Christ which spares no one, discards no one, but wraps its arms around all who will believe. We have people that are sick It should, as it did Jeremiah, bother us. It should steal our sleep. It should rob us of leisure. It should drive us to our knees, compel us to weep and pray and be a part of the solution. We love the members of our body. You can't deny the analogy. There's not one thing about yourself that you would just cut off. We know it to be insane to think just because my ear doesn't look like somebody else's ears or my nose is different than another, or I don't like one of my toes that I can just discard it at my pleasure. It doesn't work that way, does it? There's not one of you I see without a nose. I don't see anybody amputating body parts just because it doesn't fancy them. May I say to you today that if they're born again, whoever is a child of God, they're a part of the body of Christ. And that body... It's a body that's preserved to be one day blameless and brought into his presence holy and without spot. Now I realize that'll be absent of the flesh. That's how we'll get that. But right now, there's some of our body, some of the members of our body that are suffering. And I say that with all of the sympathy I have. They are suffering. You say... Preacher, they're getting what they deserved. I don't care whether they're getting it or not. What I'm saying to you is they're part of my body. And when they suffer, I suffer. And brother, what we need is some people with a compassion of heart that looks to the sinner and says, you can be cured of this. There's still a God here. There is a balm in Gilead. Yes, there is a physician among us. He can fix it. I want him to fix it. Are we sick? Right, that's the first question. Right? Because I, I wholeheartedly believe that many of us think there's nothing wrong. Are we sick? You say, well, I'm not sick. Let me remind you. If you've got members that are sick... You're sick. Isn't that what he said? You can come to church and you can smile and you can carry on and you can worship and you can do all that and we do, right? We do the best we can to persevere and to be faithful to God and to pray and to get right. And, And many of you are and you're doing the best you can. But may I say to us, it does not relinquish the responsibility 
to also grieve and mourn the sickness of our body. I don't know how many times that I lie to people. They stick their hand there and say, how you doing? Say, fine. How's the church doing? So great. And I lie. Because I want the church to do great. The truth is, the church is sick. And I ain't talking about New Providence only. But mark my words, I am talking about it. sick and you know it's sick there's all kinds of symptoms attendance just being one commitment another willingness and right and the list goes on those are just symptoms those are just the things that when we look in the mirror we say yes that's a sickness but you get some kind of ulcer on your hand, you say, that has to have some attention. That ain't right. But you, you can't keep nothing down. You, you eat, but, but it comes right back up. And you, that, you, you're going to have to do something. You can't go on like that. Huh? We'd run to a doctor the very first sign of that kind of symptom, but when we get the spiritual symptoms in our face plain, we know what to do, but we won't do it. How ridiculous are we, really? I'm not talking, I'm preaching to the choir this morning, right? Because you're the ones that want to be here. And nor am I pointing a finger at the ones that ain't here, because I can tell you right now, they're sick. And they need help. And I'm only trying to help because I do love them. And I do miss them. And I do want them here. And I do know that if there's not something done, sicknesses get worse. And it won't just affect them. It affects all of us because we are one body. We cannot, will not. It's God's economy to make it such. Salvation is not something you go through life and never involves anyone else. I can assure you today that if you're a part of Christ, you are a part of his body total. There are people all over this world that are, that are believers in Jesus Christ, and yet they are sick today. Are we sick? You know, how do you know if you're sick? Well, there's symptoms. And those symptoms, when they, begin to, when they begin to show themselves, you know that they're abnormal. And for the people of Christ, there ought to be some normal things. People of God pray. I didn't hear no amens, but that don't change the truth. People of God worship. Thank you. People of God serve. People of God love. People of God gather. See, there's some things I know. I know what's normal for the body of Christ. You say, how do you know? Because I is one. Amen. Huh? I'm part of it. I'm a member too. It's not unique to me. The truth is that he knows it too. You're not absent from this truth. I'm not springing on you some new revelation. You know what normal is in the body of Jesus Christ. What I say to you today is that some are not normal anymore. Say, what happened? They got sick. Somehow. I talked to a fellow just this morning. I said, are you sick? He said, I don't know. He said, I just lost my voice. Don't feel bad. So, but I woke up a day and couldn't talk. I said, that's not abnormal. He agreed. There's a problem, you see. But I contend that there's still a God here. There's still a balm in Gilead. There is still a physician that is able to heal and cure all of the sickness that is among us. 
But we need to be real in our own hearts about the fact that we are sick. We are. Even if by association. Some of you are, are in it. Some of you are fighting. You're working. You're doing. You're trying. And I can assure you this. God still blesses. Does he not? Anybody's at service last night? Did you get blessed? I did. I did. He filled my cup and it just ran over and over. But you know what, Alfred? I woke up this morning with the same burden. And I thank God. I thank God there's something troubling me. I thank God that I recognize as I look out and into the highways and the hedges of this world that there are my people out there and the enemy is running over them. He is stealing from them. He is infecting them. He is taking everything he can. And I want you to know that I still believe there is a cure for the sickness. We are sick. Is there hope? Yes. Yes. That's what Jeremiah was saying to the people. Now, they were in a much more desperate position than we are, so to speak, physically for sure, maybe not spiritually. But I can tell you what Jesus told the apostle Peter when Peter had revealed to him or or at least said to him, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, Peter, he said, flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you, but my father did. And he said, and upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Does anybody believe that? Yes, I believe that. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is not going down, it's going up. But am I willing to, to admit that there's some infection within the body Yes, we have to. We have to. We can't with a clear conscience just cover this up and say all is well because all is not well. I have people that I love. Mark my words, if I didn't care about them, I wouldn't speak about them. Nor would I try to share a message like this one. But I care and they're in trouble. They're in trouble. They're in such trouble that I fear what's going to happen. I fear. I fear for their soul. What is going I know, Jerry, and you know too, that because he loves me, he will chasten me. See, people are messing with something they don't understand. You say, how do you think they don't understand it? Surely, son, surely, if they understood what I was talking about, they'd run to God right now. I can't live like that, to be honest with you. I just can't do it. It terrifies me when I know sin is in my heart. You say, how come? Because I know God don't deal with sin but one way. He will eradicate it from my life one way or the other. I tell you today, we people that are in a dangerous position, it is the fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Mark my words, you will not sin and get by. I'd like to see the body strong and whole and powerful and effective but the body is only as strong as its weakest member. So therefore, I must conclude we're not strong yet because we got some weak members. We got some people that are sick. They're suffering. We've got people that we love dearly that are suffering. They've been infected by the world, the prince of this world. They've been They've been hindered. Their body has has symptoms 
that, that simply are, are wrong, right? They're not normal for a believer in Christ. Does anybody want to be sick? No. Huh? Be, right? I've already said it once, but I'm going to say it again. My finger is not pointing. Nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wakes up and says, I went out and got the flu. Ah, I just wanted it. But some of them have woke up and said, God, how did I get here? How did I get here? God, how am I so sick? Is there not a physician? Yes. Yes, there is. Can he cure? Indeed. Curing is his specialty. He's the physician. He's the surgeon. He's the pharmacist. He's the therapist. He's the counselor. There's nothing that you have that he can't fix. I'm talking about cure it. Make it go away. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've watched him take those that who really thought they had nothing left. They had gone too far. And I've seen him restore them just like that. Is there not a physician... Yes, yes, there is. There's a physician. But as in many cases, we got to get them to the doctor's office. Has he got time for them? Yep. Is there an opening in his schedule? Always. Can he help them? He can. Somebody's going to have to help here. Jesus himself gave the illustration. Right? Remember the man that was going down and the Bible said he fell among thieves and they stripped him of all he had and left him for dead. And there as he lay in the ditch, the Pharisee went by, the, 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 the scribe went by, the church went by. And then a Samaritan had compassion on him. And you know what the Samaritan had to do? He had to get in the ditch. The Samaritan had to get the blood on himself. He had to use his own resources to try to help the fella, bind him up, pouring the oil in, putting him on his own beast, walking him all the way to an inn, putting him in the inn, paying for the inn, and said, I'll come back and pay whatever else it takes. You know why? Because he recognized that the man was sick. And that by himself, he would not find the attention that he needed. Would he have died? Yes. Right there in the ditch, he would have died. Is there a cure? Yes, there's a cure for sin. There's a cure for sin. It's fixable. Right? There's no sin that is irreparable. Right? There, there's nothing that we can, we can repent unto God for that he can't say, forgiven. And he can purge of the infection that plagues the body. But some of them are going to need some help. Yes, there's some that they'll make it back on their own somehow. Right? The Holy Spirit never stops working on them if they're his. Right? He'll, he'll work in their lives. But you see, God made this to where we're all interconnected. And so when, when they suffer, I ought to be suffering, right? Unless I've detached myself somehow emotionally or spiritually from my own Christian body, which I don't think possible. We, we, have, to, we have to recognize that, that we're in this together. There's not a person that is missing from this church that we don't love. 
and need, desperately need them. We need their prayers. We need their, their worship. We need their, their talents. We need their gifts. We need every. We need them. They're the body of Christ. And I should not be okay with them not being here. All right. Come get a song. I'm, I'm going to finish right here. I could go on, actually, but I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to give one more thought. Some may say, well, this COVID thing has really just shipwrecked it. That's not the problem. Right? That's not the problem. COVID is not the issue. I, I'm not even talking about those people that that you know are still fearful of co- that. I'm not. I'm not talking about. I'm talking about sin. God called me to preach in 1987, and in 1989 I was called to pastor at Meadow Branch Church. And I have not pastored for a total of five months in those 33 years. And I have been in scores of churches, revivals, support, whatever, all. And I contend that every church I have ever went into has been sick all 33 of those years. My ministry has never seen a time when the body of Christ was whole. Buford Albright told me that day as I sat on the porch with him, he said, son, I wish you could have preached back in my day. I wish you could have seen it when scores of people would flock to the altar, repenting and crying out unto God. They'd run through the back door, screaming, I need to be saved. I wish you could have seen that. And I just looked in bewilderment as if I'll never see that. I don't know when it happened. Maybe it was, I tried to think about it as maybe a decade by the end of World War II, we had already become infected. And by the time the 60s hit, she was full on. And I contend we've not recovered. I've never seen it in my spiritual, my ministry. I've never been in a church where they had 260 people on the membership and they were all there. Not one time, not one church. Are we sick? Yes, you have to say we're sick. Is it curable? You also have to say it's curable. Do we have the cure? Yes, we have the cure too. What about a physician to admit? Yes, we, we have all that we, that's what Jeremiah was saying. He said, is, is, is God still not, is he not still in time? Is there not a balm in Gilead or a physician? Yes, the answer is yes. God's not changed. Say, preacher, you're asking for something that is, that is way beyond what we can do. Let, let me be clear. I'm not asking you to go out and save everybody in the world or restore every church in the world. I'm saying that you have joined one church, and you're in it right now. And I may not be able to, to, to do anything in the church down the road, but he did put me in this one. And I do have a responsibility for this one, Travis. They're sick. And I love them. And I need them. I miss them. I I desire more than anything that they get well. The strongholds that are binding some of them are great. But may I say, he said my weapons were great. 
to the tearing down of the strongholds. Is there a cure? Yes. And we are all a part of it. I think some of us need to ask ourselves the question whether or not we're whole. Whether or not we might be sick. What's your greatest love in this world? You'll find out pretty soon whether you've been infected. If there is any one thing that comes before Christ, you've been infected. And it will get worse. I want to be whole. I want this body of believers, this local fellowship of believers to be whole. And it's going to take all of us to do it. No exceptions. We start with ourselves and we work out. We start with the realization and the admission of our own condition. What better way to prepare for the communion than to examine ourselves right now and say, you know what? I've let this stand in the way of me serving God with all of my heart. It's time it leaves. It's time it goes. It's time I go to the physician and let him do some surgery in my life. Eradicate some of the things that shouldn't be there. He can help us today. I want him to help us. I'm praying every day, God, help us. Some of you haven't seen it. You don't even recognize it. But I've been calling 911 every day, begging for help. Why? Because they're sick, Paul. They're sick. Somebody's got to call. They're sick. We've got to have help. The only cure is Christ. But oh, if we would all beseech God for that soul that is in such a desperate need, if we would call on God, I know God can do great things. Are we willing to put ourselves into the office of the position and say, here am I, send me. I'll drive the ambulance, send me. I'll go get them, I'll go tell them. We're going to sing a song, verse or two. I don't know your heart, but if you're playing at this, If it's some, some kind of game for you, I pray he'll rock your world. We got to wake up. Because every day goes by, the summer is past, and our people are still not saved. That's the unsaved. We got, we got a church book full of people that claim to be members but they don't come to church. That is abnormal. Huh? Somebody say amen. That is abnormal for a believer. You know what that means? They're sick. Something wrong. I can't always discern what's wrong. I'm not the one doing the diagnosing here, by the way. What I'm saying is, is whether they're lost or they're saved and just sick, they need help. Because they believe one thing and do another. It's not right. I believe there's a physician still around. And I believe he wants to help us. And I don't know what it'll take, but it'll probably start with revival in me. Revival in you. A confession of sin, a commitment to serve a willingness and a dedication to let nothing stand in the way of our seeking those that are sick for Christ.
If you need him, if you want to pray, come on. Altar's open as we sing.